Isn't everybody's ears not equally aligned? I thought I read that somewhere. I, I fall asleep a lot working, which is a bad habit. And then I wake up and I'm like laying on my glasses. Oh, so. they're all bent. Yeah, they're all bent. Yeah, yeah. No, you look great. All right. Are you ready? Let's dive in, man. Right on. All right, dude. Let's do it. Cool. Oh, shit. I'm on the wrong intro script. There it is. <clears throat> What's up, UX fam? How's your mom and them? Welcome to another episode of Beyond UX Design. I'm Jeremy. If you're new here, welcome to the show. I am super stoked to have you. And if you haven't done it already, please consider subscribing to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you are regular here and you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would really appreciate you leaving a five-star review. That'll help me out so much more than you can imagine. This week's audiobook recommendation is Crushing It, How Great Entrepreneurs Build Their Business and Influence and How You Can Too by Gary Vaynerchuk. Crushing It is a go-to guide for entrepreneurs looking to build their brand in the digital age. The book offers actionable insights on leveraging social media platforms to amplify your business and personal brand. Gary V shares both his own experiences and success stories from other entrepreneurs, providing a comprehensive roadmap for anybody aiming to crush it in today's fast-paced, interconnected world. It's a must-read for those who want to turn their passion into a profitable venture, much like our guest today, Tommy Gioco. So head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash audible trial to start your free trial and download Crushing It completely free and help support the show in the process. And as always, thanks so much to Chris, Siraquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin for all their support. And if you want to join those fine folks and help keep the show independent and ad-free, you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month. That's less than a dollar an episode. And if you do that, you'll get some sweet, sweet perks for your support. And of course, if you think the show is worth sharing, then I would love it if you told some friends. I've got an awesome guest today. I am so stoked to have Tommy Gioco on the show today. I am so stoked to have him. If you haven't been following him on LinkedIn or TikTok or all the social media platforms out there, this guy has got his hands in everything. And one of the things that I'm really excited to talk to Tommy about today is when you can't find a job and you've been spending months, maybe a year looking for work, you got you to gotta make some money somehow. And I feel like Tommy knows all about that. So I'm super stoked to have Tommy on the show. Tommy Gioco is a Phoenix-based product designer, former Marine, and tech entrepreneur. He boasts an illustrious 13-year career in the design industry. He's made his mark by co-founding SteamPro.io, a successful startup in the content creator space, which he sold in 2015. And since then, Tommy turned full-time to content creation on platforms like TikTok, Instagram, and LinkedIn, where he shares insightful perspectives on design and product building. He's author of the ebook Making Design Decisions, Tommy continues to educate and inspire his audience. His latest project, Teardown.ai, will explore the UI workflows of AI products and while aiming for lofty future goals, including developing micro products and earning $5 million in the next five years, Tommy's primary aspiration remains inspiring others to achieve their professional dreams, which, Tommy, that's exactly why I want to have you on the show today. Welcome to Beyond UX Design, man. I am so stoked to have you. How's it going? Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me, man. This is awesome. Yeah, of course, dude. So like I said, man, one of the things that I am fascinated by your journey is you seem to have done it all on your own. And obviously you had help. You had help. I'm sure you, you know, you would say you probably didn't do it all by yourself, but there's so many people out there looking for work and they can't find it. And I feel like you are the man to give a lot of these folks some, some tips, some advice on what they might be able to do to make some money in the short term or maybe even long term while they're looking yeah. for work. So I'm, I'm super stoked to talk about that today, man. Well, and I'll start by saying this: um, it's tough right now, and 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 you know I don't want to downplay that. Yeah. I definitely feel for people who are looking to get work, especially in tech, in design, product management, because um, going through that feels it, going through the interview process right now. I had this experience recently with a there was like an interesting role that came up. I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring, and it's almost like an offensive process these, a lot of these, these interviewing cycles have become. Um, and, and I used to actually wear those going through that process years ago. I used to wear that as kind of like a badge of honor, like, oh yeah, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. just how we do things. And now it's, it's less like, I hate that that's how things are done yeah. now. Why should it be that way? Right. You know, um, when I first started in this field, there's a, there's a very big difference too. That I, what I've learned in, in talking to so many designers today is that you, you have a lot of designers who, and I'm one of these, who came up into this role, um, but the aspiration didn't start as, I, I want to be a designer, so I'm going to do X, Y, and Z things 
to try and land a role as a designer. Um, you have a lot of people who wanted to build product. Maybe they were entrepreneurs or maybe they were like developers and started to see that their interests and skill sets aligned more on the design side and the design field started to open up more and more. And this is, you know, 2005, 2010 period. And then, and then we really started to lean into that. And now you have a lot of people who are starting on day one uh, with the aspiration of, I want to be a designer. And then, you know, the options are boot camps and um, for traditional education and all these other paths. And so when people ask me, you know, how can I get a job today as a designer? It's not an easy question for me to relate to entirely with that right. group. Exactly. But what I do have experience in is one, you know, I, I came out of the military, four kids and a wife in tow and, and the, the ceiling of obligation, like financial obligation that I had to meet yeah, I bet. Yeah. right away. Uh, was quite was much higher than I think your typical at the time. I think I was maybe 24, 23. Uh, that's a big obligation at 23. Dude, I can't imagine. Man. And I didn't have the skills I needed coming out of the Marine Corps to do that. But I knew that I had a little bit of inclination towards like web development. And so I kind of leaned into that. And my, you know, I tried the traditional route of school. That's not for me. I just, I couldn't, I needed to, I needed more actionable learning material, like things yeah. <laughs> that I could learn that day and apply tomorrow. Sure, yeah. While I appreciated a lot of the prerequisites and the things that that traditional education um, was trying to offer me, it wasn't doing it. It wasn't cutting it. Like I needed to make money. I needed to make money by Friday. And and so for me, it was like a lot of web resources, you know, taking flyers out on, on people who I don't know if they're the best person teaching this material, but I'm going to buy their product and I'm going to try to apply it to the you know, how to create a WordPress theme or how to, how to code PHP, like really learning scrappy and turning around and finding a way to, to sell that value to other people. So I immediately from day one coming out of the Marine Corps, when I uh, became very keenly aware that that wasn't the lifestyle I wanted to live, being gone all the time. Sure. Uh, bad man, yeah. And instead uh, I said, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep hard charging towards let me try to make this new career happen. So that was my first like career shift. So I get a lot of people asking questions like, how do I bridge the gap? Well, I wouldn't recommend doing it the way I did, which was having <laughs> only $5,000 in your bank account and going like, I'm just going to learn a skill and try to sell that skill any yeah, way man. I know how. And I did yeah. all kinds of things to try and sell it. Picking up the phone and, and calling small uh, businesses around me to see if they needed WordPress sites, um, scraping yellowpages.com and, and Yelp and, and contacting businesses that way and just really grassroots stuff. And, and ultimately for me, when I first started, and this was like 2010 uh, period, it was, it was like the freelance job boards that really helped me. And they were low quality gigs. Sure. But they yeah, were local gigs. companies. Yeah. Needing a website or something. Yeah. But you know, like they gave me, Alex Hermosi talks about like the knowledge debt gap and, and I don't love everything that he says. And I'm always wary of like knowledge gurus, uh, <laughs> but there is some, there's some value right there in the knowledge debt idea, which basically says that if you're doing a career transition or you're trying to get into something new, whether it's like a side hustle or any kind of project, you know, you, you do need to learn the skills to make that thing happen. But you also, you also need to afford the time, um, and you're going to pay for it in one way or another, to learn what you don't know. And, and, and that might be a skill that might be like domain specific. Like if you're trying to get into AI, there might be a lot of uh, things that you have to kind of uncover as you get into that space. And you can, you can learn that through time, or you can learn that through throwing money at it and paying for somebody else's productization of the things they've learned, which will speed up your time. But in some way, you need to cross that knowledge, that, that, that gap that's going to happen, that pay, that pay off that knowledge debt. And for me, getting into the freelance side was like, it was, was a way to start paying off that knowledge debt, just trying. And it was, it was a terribly stressful way to do it because <laughs> uh, I was learning what I didn't know in ways that would be consequential to the product. And so I was spending all my week working on the pro on, on getting that sh uh, service shipped to the client and then also yeah. spending an additional amount of time trying to learn it as I was going. And so that was, that was the initial start for me. And the reason I tell that story is because today, if people ask me like, I want to transition or I want to try to get into a side project. So I don't always have to rely on my, you know, on the salary or, or seeking salary somewhere. 
Um, I wouldn't say just up and ditch everything and go and do it the way that I did it. That, <laughs> that's, that, that's, that was, I was fortunate that that worked out long term, but initially it was really, really detrimental to my mental health. It was really detrimental to um, my relationships. And if I could do it again, and I'm kind of doing that this time around, or I did that this time around, I would, I would take on an additional amount of hours on the side um, that was sustainable for me. Maybe it's five to 10 hours a week and start chipping away at that knowledge debt. I would buy a product that maybe helps me when I don't have enough time to, you know, I don't have four weeks to learn the thing. I'd rather learn it in two weeks. I'd pay for that difference. Um, and then at the same time, I would, I would kind of learn as I go. So what, what that looks like to me is if I want to learn how to create content on social media, right? And this could be a number of different things. I would just start doing that. I might buy like a course on how to do that. I might research a couple of courses. There's plenty of them today. There's courses on everything today. And as much as those get a bad rap, I really, I actually think there's some, like I wish that yeah. kind of thing existed when I first started, you know? And, and so I, I, would, I would look at something like that and I'd pair that with a small, um, and, and be ambitious long-term, but like, like pick something small that you can, can kind of create right now and maybe launch in the next 30 days, whether that's like a, a social media content channel or it's a product on the internet, anything like that, a notion template and pair that course with just your efforts. So try, get stuck, buy some, some information, buy, pay off some of that knowledge debt with cash, get unstuck, right? Cause you apply it to your project, rinse, repeat. And that for me has been the way that I now cross those, those knowledge debt or pay off that knowledge debt. Um, while still kind of keeping the maintenance on my financial obligations. And that's the way I would recommend for people to kind of think about that right now while you're in the process of job hunting or making a career transition or you're working at a, at a place that you don't really want to be at much longer, but you, know, you can kind of entertain some of the ideas on the side without putting yourself in that financial burden. Because the minute that financial burden becomes uh, too heavy, is, is when everything goes out the window. You're I mean, done, your yeah. life just gets so much more stressful. You get way less productive. All these ambitions start to feel hopeless if you're not able to meet that initial financial obligation. So I really have high risk tolerance at times, <laughs> but the way I initially did it was, was uh, pretty irresponsible. And, and I, I, I like to call that contrast out. I'm wiser now. And so... <laughs> So yeah, certainly man. do what you can to maintain that financial obligation and chip away, chip away intelligently. So having two kids of my own right now, I can't imagine doing that with four kids <laughs> and going off and building my own thing. My wife and I actually, well, so is my backstory. I feel like it's very similar to yours. I, I wasn't in the military, obviously, but um, I started doing websites back in the day. So I started, I think I built my first website with 2003, 2002, 2003 with like GeoCities, right? Back in the day. Yeah, yeah. And eventually I got into doing WordPress sites and my wife and I, she's actually a designer as well. She's a graphic designer. We got into doing our own kind of thing and we did a very different route though and we got burnt out very quickly. And I want to I want to point this out. You're mentioning productizing and selling something. We did the service route where we would do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hourly rates. I, know, I think at the time it was like 75 bucks an hour. And, you know, we would do our own thing and it got to the point where, you know, doing the service stuff, and this is something I want to talk to you about in a second, but doing the service stuff, you can only make as much as you're able to work, right? Versus yeah, the product yeah. you can sell and you have as many as you could sell. You can make as much money as you could possibly sell versus the service side where you can only make as much as you're able to work. <laughs> so yeah. very different. And we went that route and I was actually working full time. She was doing it on the side. So we had our own little gig, you know, and we had our own little LLC and we had a bunch of clients doing websites and print design and logo design and website design. But we got, I feel like that was the kind of thing we got burnt out because we weren't selling a product. We were doing the hourly rates and we weren't making a lot. I think we were making, Amy was making 50,000 a year. And that was with both of us actually though, you know, yeah. so really it was like making 25 each. But all the money went to her so she could, you know, have her, have her salary and I was still working full time. And, um, you know, that was like hard, man. And then we finally quit because we wanted to have kids and we were like, we can't afford to have kids if we do this full time. How are you, how are you going to work when we're trying to like handle kids and everything? And right. uh, just like you said, man, that was exactly what happened. The financial burden got to be like, you know what? We can't. I can't. Like, yeah. I got to go get a job. 
because I can't do this anymore. You powered through, which I have mad props for that. But yeah, very similar backstory. I think we just kind of went the opposite route and ended up not. And now we both work full time. But uh, anyway, I don't know. It's fascinating that you mentioned that. I love that idea of calling out the, the product to sell. That's a great call out because I think what I learned and, and I'm still like, you know, I've been doing this for 13 years now and, and there's a lot where I'm at today is like, I value audience building significantly and, and I'll get into like why, but it first started, I was like you, like I did service-based businesses, right? Like that was my thing. I was providing hourly wait, uh, rates. I was trying to learn how to get like better retainers so that mm-hmm. yeah. if I could charge a retainer, it could be more predictable. And, you know, yeah. it, would be, it would be four years since I actually broke into like what I felt like were more mature product organizations. And I was working very like agency, very like high stress, just like deliverable output. And that didn't necessarily change a ton when I went to these so-called mature org- product organizations, but um, being in-house was something I really enjoyed. But before I got to that place, what I was doing while I was doing service-based work, and one of the things I tried to do for a long time, really what got me into this was I, I knew that I wanted, and I was kind of like romanticizing like the VC, the venture capitalist like play of building a software um, at the time, like Silicon Valley was just pumping out interviews with VCs and founders like, you know, Drew Houston, Dropbox, like the people that were killing it out there. And I was like, really like, oh, I, I really want to try to create a product and build a business. I don't want to continue doing service based forever. And, and so I would, I would go through a number of products on the side and it was really important for me to, um, to have a partner in that because I knew that I wouldn't be able to do it by myself. And I was really uh, fortunate yeah. to meet who would eventually become one of my technical co-founders um, on a number of products that we released. And so we would work on those products on the side and then I would do a whole bunch of agency work and I was, I was extremely overworked. And I'll talk a little bit about how I've like dealt with overworking because that became a really yeah, big pivotal moment in my life later. But I was, I was just grinding, grinding, grinding. We'd launch a product. It wouldn't do very well. We'd launch a product. It wouldn't do very well. And then we launched a product and it did extremely well. And we were floored. We had no idea what to do about it. And, but the, what I knew was as soon as it started doing well, I wanted nothing to do with anybody <laughs> else's stuff. Like yeah. I didn't all my, it was the, that was like so incredibly difficult to care about the clients I was working for oh, outside Batman, of like yeah. the relationships that I had built with them, which was the only thing that kept me going. I really just did not want to work on that. I wanted to work on the thing that I could make work that I, I really enjoyed that to me was the representation of a future where I didn't have to work as hard, but I still got to focus on like my vision of what I thought was valuable and our customers love the product. And so it was just like the full circle of everything that was really rewarding to me. And that, that feeling I became quickly, like that became the North star for how I wanted to continue forward. And we would sell that product. I would learn a lot of heartbreaking lessons about <laughs> uh, getting into the, the, to the, the deep end in Silicon Valley and selling to, you know, large capital and, and, you know, the vision's going to be yours, but the vision's not actually yours and oh, I bet, all yeah. the things that come with that. So I stayed with the acquiring company for about a year. And then, uh, at that point I had made some money, but not enough money to just work on my own things. Um, but I was working out of Silicon Valley and I, I stayed out there for about four years and living in the Bay changed my view on product. I learned so much from so many smart people. Um, I, I finally had felt like somebody who was using kind of piecemeal lessons from the internet and not really knowing the who's who to kind of listen to, or at least having an idea of how to evaluate the quote unquote who's who. I, I started to feel a little bit more plugged in and really started to understand the value of product design. Um, and, and that's when I decided if I'm going to go to the labor force, I looked at the skills that I had to leverage over the last four years leading up to that point of that sale. And it was, you know, it was development, it was design, it was marketing. There were so many hats I had worn. Um, and then I had to ask like the scary question is, is like, am I even employable? Oh, damn. Yeah. Uh, because of how, when you, when you feel so general, like it, it feels hard to kind of pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Um, at the same time, when you only represent yourself as I'm a designer, 
It's like, does my body of work even represent what I do? Because I would try to go into interviews and talk about, you know, I started this business and I tried to do this thing. It's like, you know, when you're, when you're applying for a role, those things are, are great, but th- that's not going to, that's not the conversation for that. It's not what they're looking for. Right. You know? Yeah. So, and it was, it was, I became very aware at that point that I, you know, I, I worked, I worked out in the Bay for, for four or five years. And, and that the big thing out there that I learned was, you know, the different ways that we could create systems around delivering product. And I, I really wanted to start finding ways to do that. Again, I got the itch to kind of create my own products, but I wanted to do it smarter because in, in selling that company, a few things had happened up to that point. I had gotten divorced. I even had a mental health crisis at one oh, point wow. uh, following that. I really was having kind of this crisis about identity. I had come from the Marine Corps and jumped into just continuously running into trying to shift to be uh, working in tech. I wasn't even saying I wanted to be a designer. I was actually trying to learn to code really well. And I, there was no, and, and one of the things that happens a lot when you come from one career to the, the next, and this is huge in the military as well, regardless of, you know, your experience in the military, leaving the military is a shift in identity. And a lot of people build like a self-worth out of the identity. And I never, I never really mourned that because I immediately was considering myself, no, I'm, I'm replacing my identity. I feel like an entrepreneur. I'm a technologist. And, and I lived in that. And then I had a startup and I sold it and I got to live in that. And I got to kind of bask in this, oh, you sold a startup identity and it felt validating. And then I left the company and I was working in the Bay, but now I was no longer a startup founder. And so like I, I had a, you know, my next identity crisis and I think it all just stacked and it weighed and it felt like I had been working so hard for so many years, for so many hours. And it felt by the, by the time I kind of took inventory, I was like, I don't know if this was worth it. And that was a really, a really dramatic moment for me to really like step back and say like, what? What, what does it actually mean to want to work hard and where's the balance at and how can I do this better later in my life? And so I'm going to pause for a second and just kind of let that, I, that was a, that's a big story. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about like the, the ties between folks that are maybe career shifting because the part of, there's a lot of people that listen to this that are career shifters, a lot of junior yeah. designers, but a lot of career shifters as well. And, you know, for instance, I know several people who have come, who have come from, you know, the culinary field, chefs, Mm. uh, working in service industry, things like that, teachers, you know, and there's, there's for sure an identity that goes along with being, when you say teacher, you you know, something comes to your head, like, oh, that's, that's a teacher, you know? So there's that identity tied to that. And for those people that make that shift from anything really to design, I feel like a lot of people go through that. You know, I don't think that's, I mean, it certainly, I feel like the military might be a little different for sure because of, you know, going through boot camp and, you know, the, the idea of like tearing you down to build you back up to in the, in the, in the mold oh, of yeah. the Marines, right? My dad was a Marine. So I know all about that. <laughs> Once a Marine, always a Marine. So, you know, that, that's kind of fascinating even in, in and of itself, but that idea though, of having an identity and going from one to the other, there's probably a spectrum there. But, um, I feel like that's something that a lot of people go through and especially when people are thinking, I'm not going to be a teacher anymore. I'm going to be a UX designer. I'm going to be a designer or something. And then yeah. they go and look for a job and they can't find a job for months and months at a time. That's painful. That's that hurts. So I'm curious is, do you have any advice for people going through that and how they might be able to get through that? Or is that just so personal? It's maybe, maybe hard to give advice. I don't know. It's, it's a tough thing to give advice to, you know, cause it's, it is very difficult, you know, especially for certain societies to not assign and, and get our self-worth out of, out of like our professional contributions, our titles, yeah. the things that make us. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, I'll, I'll get to like what I might say as advice, but, but just to empathize a little bit with that, when I moved out to San Francisco, you know, people, people looked at me and said, oh, you like sold a company and that's awesome. And, and I thought, okay, that's great. But I was looking around me, I have no college education. Right. And I'm living in San Francisco and everyone around me is like either Ivy League or, or, or just have in my mind these, yeah. these accomplishments and these uh, accolades that I'm not used to being around. And I'm not, you know, so I really started to feel imposter syndrome. I, my oh, first that. role was a product designer at a company of well, my favorite company that I've ever worked at still to this day called Quantcast. And I learned so much there. 
And the people that I got to learn from and work with were incredibly talented, very smart people. And I was terrified. I'm like, how did I even land this <laughs> role? I, they're they're going to yeah. figure this out eventually, you know, was my thinking. And, you know, the, the thing that I just leaned back on for me, because imposter syndrome um, and, and kind of this fear of, of, am I good enough? Am I even going to be qualified to sit at the same table as some of these people? Uh, one, what I've learned is to live inside of that. And, and it's a really, it can be a very uncomfortable and scary feeling um, for me. And I hate military and sports analogies, but there is a little bit of the military that I leaned on when I would think about imposter syndrome, which is there's a really terrifying situation in front of me and I need to kind of run towards it to deal with it rather than escape away from it in things like alcohol or avoidance or whatever other kinds of things I can manifest to protect my mental state from that fear, I need to lean into it. And so when I think about imposter syndrome, now I associate it with things like growth. Okay, this is a scary situation because I don't know what I need to know. So how can I prepare for this so that I can be at least a little more successful than if, than, you know, if it just blindsided me? And preparation is huge. And this can go for anything from like you have a, a design meeting coming up and it's maybe your first you know, big feedback meeting with some key stakeholders in the room that maybe you haven't interacted with yet. Or you, know, you have to pitch a business idea to a room of investors or you have to even just give a speech to people. Public speaking is terrifying for some folks. Or it's just, you know, I'm going to make the transition or I need to ask for a raise. No matter what it is, and this is what I meant earlier when I say my method to approaching any of these things is to try, get stuck, learn, get unstuck. And that little sequence has carried me through so many of these terrifying paths of unknown. So, okay, I'm just going to start walking. I'm eventually going to run into a brick wall. When I hit that brick wall, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a, a reaction to go, oh, crap. It's a, you know, I'm, I don't know what to do here. I guess I should turn around, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to evaluate the wall, whatever the challenge is. I'm going to look, look for some information that's very specific to solving this problem in front of me, not something more high level than that, just necessary for what I need right now. And then I'm going to go past that. So if it's, you know, how to, how to public speak, or it's like, are there templates I can get that will help me give this presentation better? I'll add my own flair. And, and suddenly like you start to do that. And you might not nail it the first time. I, I often didn't, but you still get through it. And in getting through it, you go, you know, here's what worked. Here's what I would do differently. And then you start to have your own personal data points you can pull things from. And, and for me, when you start to accumulate more of those, the more you do some of this, the more you go through the hiring cycle, everyone knows that your first interview is typically the worst. And then <laughs> your, your you know, later stages of the interviews, you start to get you become a pro at talking about yourself or explaining a, a piece of your work. And the same goes for absolutely everything else you do. So the question was about how do I deal with the identity crisis? And that's not necessarily um, the full bit of advice. But the first part I would say is use that small framework for getting through anything that's immediately terrifying to you. And in an identity crisis, the thing that's terrifying to you is this idea that your self-worth is going away and you're starting from, you know, ground, uh, you know, from day one, uh, and, and no longer you're getting the kind of reception about who you are as this external feedback, uh, pushing through that, trying to uh, afford yourself not to need permission from anybody, but yourself to move forward in that direction. And yeah, you might have to take some steps back and take a lower salary, you might have to, you know, you might have been respected and and in in regarded as kind of the authority in a space before, whereas you're coming into a place where you're you you're looking up to everybody for answers. And if you can get through that part of it, then then don't look for permission. Just do and try and get stuck and go through the process until you start to have your own data points where suddenly you know, you are kind of a person that a few folks are looking to. And, and that's how you start to build your value in, in any role. You know, you mentioned something like the military taking some things away. And 
I actually, it's funny. I had a, uh, an interview not long ago with Andrew Rice. Do you know him? He's a Marine. He's on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've talked with him actually. Cool, awesome. Yeah, he's a great dude. Anyway, we, we were talking not long ago and we, we brought up this idea of VUCA, which is actually something that I think it was the, the U.S. War College or something like that, the Military War College. I'm not exactly sure who came up with it, but it's a mil- the military came up with this idea of VUCA after the collapse of the Soviet Union volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And the idea mm. was, you know, now the Soviet Union broke up all these all these rogue states with nukes and all the tanks and planes and everything else that, that the Soviet Union had, right? What are they going to do? How are they going to react? Yeah. So they came up with this concept of VUCA. And it's something like I actually learned in a leadership training that I had for, for work, but it applies to life in general. And I think especially like a lot of the things like you're talking about, right? Volatile, things change all the time, uncertain, like we don't know what's going on, complex, a million little moving parts, ambiguous, you know, it's like all these things are just hazy and fuzzy and we don't really understand that's, that's like life, but that's also career shifting. That's trying to find a job. That's trying to, trying to interview. That's trying to start a business. You know, that's like so much that, that there's, you know, it's interesting. You talk a lot about understanding the unknowns and learning and getting stuck and then, and then, you know, or, or getting stuck and then learning and then progressing forward. And to me, that, 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 th- that idea that you got from the military, I think is so profound. And a lot of people, you know, when they think about the military, they think of like, you know, grunts, uh, you know, saluting or doing push-ups or something. <laughs> right. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of really interesting concepts there that I feel like, you know, we could probably talk for another hour just about that, that stuff alone. But I, I just want to point that out, that idea of VUCA and, and, and how this concept can apply to all the things that you're talking about you know, and it's just such a fascinating concept. I don't know if you've ever heard of that that term before, but it's just awesome. So I haven't heard of VUCA and and I was just a grunt on the ground, like a literal <laughs> grunt on the ground. And and so like we we had li- lots of ditties and and different things that we would use it that I have used in and including like there's there's a uh there's one for preparation, right? Piss poor performance or uh I can't even remember it now. It's been so many years. <laughs> but uh there there are things I've taken that have really helped me here. I recognize it's a tired analogy sometimes to write about that stuff, but I do sometimes talk about, you know, some of the same principles for getting through like an ambiguous or terrifying situation. I used to say something to myself to keep the sanity, to keep kind of my mental health in check, uh, which was, you know, hey, relax, you're not saving lives anymore. Like this before it used to be, and I, and I realized <laughs> like saying that out loud is not actually very helpful. And, and I, and it kind of downplays like, cause the work we are doing can be stressful sure, and it yeah, is yeah. tough. And, and I realized it used to take away from that. So I've, I've kind of learned like which, which analogies best serve these circumstances. But you know, what I will say is when I think about what I did in the first half of my career and how I'm approaching kind of this second half. I might, I don't know what chapter I'm in. Maybe it's the third, but (laughs) who knows? The thing is, is I I used to put all my eggs into a single basket and Mm -hmm. you know, with the economy, we have no idea where this economy is going to go. We don't know how AI is going to impact the landscape of this role. There's a lot of infighting and what it means to be a designer today, (laughs) more than I think there's ever been. Oh yeah, man. It's really just, it's it's taking a lot of time. And I think it's causing a lot of people I think it's causing a lot of inner turmoil for people who are trying to make money doing this. And for me, I, I, I see these arguments um, and, I, and I look at my past on how I kind of came up into this role. And all I ever wanted to do was to create value for people in some small corner of the world that allowed me to feel like my work was meaningful and provide for my family. That's yeah. all I've ever yeah. wanted. That, that has been like the true guiding light. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to sacrifice my mental health and my physical health and my relationships to do that. And, and it started to feel like that's an impossible dream. Like there's no way you can get that. There's just nothing you can do. And, and that was a dangerous thought. Cynicism has got to get its butt out of the room if you want to accomplish that. I promise you today, if you're a cynical person, you won't accomplish that. Cynicism will destroy any of those ambitions for you. Um, it'll make you feel clever and, you know, you might have a couple good quips on the internet or at a party, uh, but that's as far as cynicism will get you. And so when I really start, I, I noticed the cynicism kind of creeping in and I thought was stream pro kind of my one hit wonder at, at possibly achieving that outcome. 
And there was something I started to notice because when I first started in this and even before my time, it was, you know, if you're going to build a company, get yourself a, a developer, or an engineer, co-founder. They will help build this and bring a certain domain experience that you need in the room. And then, you know, Steve Jobs and Apple started to really receive their flowers. And the narrative kind of shift to if you want a really good company, get yourself a design co-founder because they're going to really help elevate that customer and user experience. And then it's starting to turn differently now. And so when I look at the state of things today, social media has plenty of warts that we, <laughs> we can criticize yeah. and its impact on society. One of the things that social media does incredibly well is it allows the little people like you and I to have easy access to distribution in a Absolutely, world that man. used to gatekeep distribution behind paywalls and, and you know, the who's who if you had a network. And so what I, what I have realized now is the, the conversation is now if you want to start building better moats around your company, you want to start building better value from day one, get yourself a co-founder with an audience already. Uh, and that yeah. can potentially, and, and it's not as simple as that, but that, I, what I've learned can be, um, it, it can really be an incubator for new business ideas. And so I think about, okay, I used to, you know, I want this, this value add uh, to create for people. I want to have this lifestyle where I can create value, do some creative work, um, but also just enjoy my life and not, you know, lose all the things I love about it in the process. Creating content and building an audience really started to make a lot of sense to me. And so when, I, when people ask me, like, how can I start thinking about getting into the space? I'm not saying you need to create an audience. But when I look at the first half of my life and I look at my life now, what I, what I do think people need to remember, designers especially, is like, why are you getting into this, this field? For me, it was I wanted to create value. And, and value comes in so many shapes and sizes. And being a designer is not the only way I can create value. I can be a developer. I can be an entrepreneur. And, and what is value? And I think a lot of times I hear a lot of junior designers today talk about value in this really simple form of it's a piece of software. It must be a piece of software. And it has to look like this and behave like this. And it must achieve design excellence. And it must do this and have this thing. And, and, and the idea of value has gotten so convoluted in the conversation today. And then, and then those same people will look over at somebody who is selling or providing a notion template full of resources, for example, and they'll criticize that piece of value. They'll say that's, that's low effort and that's not design excellent. And that's not, that's just a, a something someone wrote up in the, you know, their basement. But that's valuable to somebody. Somebody's paying for it, yeah. And, 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 and I bring that kind of example up, and I don't sell Notion templates or things like that, but I bring that example up to, to get people to start kind of exercising within their own mind. Like, what is value? And how can I create that for people? Is it a service-based thing I can do for someone? Is it a one-on-one -on -one I can provide to somebody? Um, is it a piece of software that I can maybe use like a web flow tool to no code and make a really hacky version before I validate if I should invest into developers to make it more robust. Like, what does that look like? And are there things I can be doing today to make that? There's so many people who are starting out in this field and they're like, are there some, you know, free design exercises I can do? And there's some websites out there with prompts and you can create a thing in Figma and then it just lives and dies in your Figma file. And that's okay. Hey, put that on your portfolio. Maybe it'll uh, represent some of your visual design skills. But the other side of it is like, what can you actually do that might actually create value in a way someone will trade a dollar for it, you know? Right, yeah. And, and it could be a notion template. Like your entire learning journey as you're paying off that knowledge debt, your entire learning journey could be productized. You could turn that into something. Hey, I'm going to start a social media, I'm going to start a TikTok or a Twitter account, and I'm just going to like document my experience trying to get a job as a day one designer transferring over from a different field. And I'm going to provide, I'm going to put all my resources in this thing. I'm going to tell you what's working. I'm going to, 
you know, you're not going to record your conversations, but I'm going <laughs> to let you know the questions I asked. And like that kind of thing is going to be valuable to people. And I think people, so many, this is what I mean by being permissionless. There's so many people who would say, yeah, but who am I? No one wants to hear that. There are so many people yeah. who would at least want someone to empathize with and to be within a same, in a similar setting to see what's working. Sure. It would be helpful for us to be able to have access to more senior folks who can give us answers right away. But don't, like, for example, the Slack group that you and I met in is a Slack group that I put together last year when I decided to go full time into this effort. And I didn't put it together to create a paid community. I didn't put it together to have any sort of monetary benefit. I put it together just because I wanted a place for other design content creators with audiences of any size to come and commiserate together because I was lonely. <laughs> I was just lonely and it was a terrifying prospect going full time into content creation. And that Slack and that Slack group has turned into something tremendous. And so I would I would recommend to people going through their journey to think about ways that you can kind of cross pollinate with other little efforts. Put it in an ocean template, build a small community of people. And by build a community, it can be just like, hey, do you want to just like share what's working for you and we'll celebrate each other's wins? Oh, you just got hired. Like, let's go, you know? Well, you, you mentioned something too. I just want to, I want to call out and talk about that a minute, but being permissionless, like not yeah. waiting for permission to do something, not like thinking outside of your own little box of what you think, you know. And I think a lot about, you know, when designers, they want to be designers. I want to be a designer. And they think about productizing something or selling something. They think, well, I have to sell something design related, obviously, because I'm a designer now. Right. But especially people that have come over career shifting. If you you were in theater, create a course about theater. Yes. Sell that. If you were in, you know, if you were in the culinary, to create a course about how to chop onions, different ways to chop things and put that on Udemy or something. I guarantee you there are people out there that are like, I would love to learn how to chop. Let right. me, you know, I, I want to go or, or put it on YouTube or something. You don't have to create something just because you, you're a new designer doesn't mean you have to focus on that design field and think you have to sell something or build something related to that. So I just love that you call that out. One of the things I really try to teach a lot of designers is how effective of an entrepreneur many of us can be because of some of the skills that are in this, this field. And even if you haven't been in this field for a while, but you know you have an inclination towards certain skills like user research, uh, visual design, um, thinking through the customer or the user workflow of the entire business or product. If those things you're really into, that's fantastic. Like minimum viable skills as, yeah. as an entrepreneur with a new idea. And, and just what you said, like all the, the products I've created up until this past year, because now I look back at the things I've been good at and design is now one of those things. And so I productize a book about it and I'm doing some other things. It's not the only thing though, right? When I first started, I looked at what are the things I liked or that I was good at? Well, for me, I had a very big interest in esports. It was kind of my escape when I wasn't working so hard. And so I was really big into tuning in at, at certain esports. Dota 2 has always been my favorite. And uh, so I would tune into that a lot. And so that was one of the first products we created was a, an esports app. And that didn't go very well. But what it did is, is by working on something like that, this wasn't a spec project. I mean, it was a real thing that went to market. It made a few bucks. It had like 10,000 users at one oh, point. Wow. But working on, and, and that makes such a great case study. Even if you fail at these little micro uh, experiments, they become kind of real experiments. And you're like, here's what I learned from this. And, and I'll tell you, <sighs> having been on the hiring manager end, when I meet people who are, uh, when I'm interviewing and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at people's projects and I see, oh, like you tried to take something to market, that's so much more compelling. Yes. Than just getting like, uh, you know, case studies that are kind of enclosed into their own thing. And there's, I, I empathize with, there's a lot of challenges in taking something to market, especially an app. You need a developer um, and, and it, that, that comes with a whole slog of issues. Like, where do I find them? Should I outsource? How much money should I spend on that? And I, and I recognize that, but I will say, problem solve that. Try, get stuck, learn do, is the only process to, to buy development time? Is there a no-code tool that you could create an MVP from? And there's many coming out today. Is there a, a smaller version? For example, teardowns.ai. I just released a product. It is, it is a library of video and screenshots of AI products. Basically, I was working on a, an AI product earlier this year 
And pageflows.com is a fantastic resource I've used for a big chunk of my career. And it just is breakdowns of like onboarding and e-commerce workflows. And there was nothing that existed even inside of Pageflows that documented AI workflows mm. because they're so new and so many products are um, still implementing those. But there are like, there's not a lot of ceiling on UI and UX patterns in desktop and mobile products today. I think we are, we are reaching, in some cases we've reached the ceiling and we're just kind of reinventing wheels. But AI does offer some new ways to approach its implementation. And, and I wanted to document that. So one, I wanted to learn personally. I was already documenting these patterns. I was going through a product. I'd sign up for it. I'd record some screenshots. And, and the hardest part was I'd try to classify, like, what were the shared, you know, if I were to categorize oh, a pattern, the patterns, yeah. what, is, what is the pattern? And, and, I, and that was kind of hard to do. And I'm sure yeah. that's going to continue to change over time. But because I was already doing that, I was putting it in a Notion database. I was having a link to the video. And, and that by itself, that by itself. So I got, a, I got over 100 of those now. But because I was already doing that work and I decided to do kind of the extra 30% to actually make it available to the public and charge for it, I could have just sold that Notion template or that Notion document, not template. Yeah, but sure. I, yeah, I, yeah. I could have just sold that. And I'm sure that that would have made a little bit of money. That's not going to be you know what you build your family, uh, your family's nest egg on top of, but it is, it is a way to start thinking about what are the things you're already doing now that you could take a step further. And, and as a designer with the kind of skills we have, you could go off and design that landing page and you could yeah. test the market with that. And you could, your customers, as they start to, you know, send their emails in to sign up for this product, you could start to send them uh, questionnaires or ask for feedback and apply that feedback to that product. And, and, you know, and then if you get some validation, then take the next step and get it developed into uh, an actual app like I did. And, and so that's, that's the kind of thing I want people to think about is like, what is value? Well, value, the, the end state might be this piece of software that you want to get created, but what's value about that valuable about that? Is it like, yeah, it probably increases the experience to have a really nice navigation and, and a really nice uh, polished visual design. But you might be able to get away up front by just testing that out. And in doing so, maybe it earns you a tiny bit of runway to keep moving towards that next version. I want to call out something again that you mentioned. And I think this is actually like a really fascinating way to look at it. And I wonder if you've ever thought about it this way. But there's a lot of people out there that are listening to this right now that are probably like, I, I could never be an entrepreneur. Like working on my mm -hmm. own. No mm -hmm. way. That's gonna, it's terrifying, right? But you just said something. I want to put a couple things together. You okay. did the first 70% putting it all together for other stuff. And then you just took the other 30%. The other thing you mentioned was you've got a case study. You got something there, right? Yeah. And a lot of these junior designers or career transitioners are looking to build up a portfolio. And I talked to Colton and Ludovic from Kick-Ass UX not long ago. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I love that they do is they, they really encourage people to find something they're passionate about and do a case study for that. And one of the things I'm putting all this together, but one of the things that I love is that you mentioned, you got to do a case study, find something you're passionate about. Start doing the work. And once you've done that, you've got your 70% of the way there. How much effort is it to take it 30% more and try to monetize it? Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of people out there that are thinking about like, you know, you dip your toes in, just try it out and see, you know, do run, run an experiment. Like you said, now you've got a really cool case study, even if you never monetize it at all, even if you don't yeah. go the other 30%, you got a cool case study. And when you go and interview with somebody, that passion about that problem that you found is going to shine through and it way more than the dog walking app or whatever right. other bullshit prompt you found online or your boot camp <laughs> gave you to, to, to do a case study on. Right. So even if you don't take it that other 30%, doing what you're talking about is still valuable because it gives you something that you can really speak to and impress yeah. somebody with the passion when you, when you describe it in that, that meeting, in that interview, right. you know? So anyway, yeah. I, I just found that fascinating. I'd like putting all those things together and I just love that advice. You know, you got the 70%, just take it 30% more and see what happens. And, and it is an exercise. I mean, you have to, it's, it's really thinking like, uh, I can't remember the term that Amazon uses for it, but they look at their waste. They say, we're already producing this stuff mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't get used anywhere. Where can we take some of that and leverage it further and, and make it work for us even more? And, and I think that's a really smart concept to apply to just the things we do on a day-to-day. And that's really, for me, it's like, I, I have a problem now where there's so many shiny objects in front of me. <laughs> I, have to, I have to regularly workshop where to focus. And I use like this decision matrix process that really helps me. 
because when you have so many things in front of you, like where to, where to focus um, is a really scary prospect. Like if you invest into this thing, that opportunity cost of not investing into other thing is, you know, terrifying. But the thing that I would say to people is when you start exercising that muscle of like, how, where, where do I have waste that I can like repurpose into something that works for me? And, and for the people who aren't entrepreneurial, I used to think being entrepreneurial meant I had to be like type A uh, on CNBC, like running an entire <laughs> company. And yeah. I, listen, I, I have a presence online now. I've learned how to talk on the microphone, but I'm exhausted when I do live streams. I'm exhausted when I'm in social settings. I would way rather like nerd out on esports or do something in private. Like I'm a very private person who likes to just enjoy th- my family time. And, yeah, and I'm sure. not, so I, I don't know if I'm an extrovert. I don't feel like I am. I don't feel like I get energized from that. But a lot of people would argue I'm not an introvert. But I, I think I am an introvert when it comes to businesses. And the reason I bring that up is because my goal now is to just build businesses out of the office, hang out with the family. And I don't want to have big teams. I want to have maybe like a couple of people that we do some work together. And that's like as big as we, I don't want to grow and scale and do all these things. And, and I feel like for people who think they're not entrepreneurial, um, they might only, they might suffer from what I suffered from, which was like the only version of entrepreneurial that they're aware of has to be this like high performing type A in front of the public all the time personality. And I don't, I, that's just not true. And so I want to like, just if you're somebody who's already doing spec work, you do a prompt on a dog walking app, you know, there's other things you could do to leverage that quote unquote waste that goes beyond just now, this is now part of my portfolio. You could, you could showcase that on social media. There's a, someone we know, Soren, and he does yeah. these fantastic bite-sized, oh, so uh, absurd <laughs> UI designs. It's like, what if Uber I had a, so much, yeah. <laughs> what if Uber had like, you had to fight for your seat or like these different features that are starting to go uh, quite viral all over social media. And it's a small thing, right? He's not charging for that. And actually, I'm sorry, he made a book. He made a coffee table book, yeah, which, I think right. he's doing, <laughs> which I think is doing pretty well now I of love these it. awesome designs. And, and that's, not, that's the entrepreneurial spirit. That is, that, that is not somebody who's this type A standing in front of people. They, they're just doing something they've already enjoyed doing, taking that extra 30% hosting it online. And the second order effects of doing things like that include building an audience. And what I'm learning about audience building is once you have an audience, you can start to take new little ideas to that audience and they'll tell you if they're valuable enough and they'll pay for them if they are, and they won't pay for them if they're not. And that becomes such an asset to people and you can do it from your bedroom. You don't have to make videos like I do. You can do it without even having to put your face on screen. And so for the introverted entrepreneur, I would say, like, consider that you can do those things. Now, here's the one asterisk, and this is what I talked about early on. These aren't things that you can do to, that will make a change in your life significantly tomorrow, right? These are, these are marathons. These are things you do because you enjoy them and because you have, like, a, a small gut feeling that they can turn into more down the road. And in the meantime, you have to solve for your immediate problems, your immediate financial obligations. And so that's why I tell people, don't do what I did, which was take the big <laughs> plunge. Jump it. Uh, w- one day you will have to make a decision to take what feels like a plunge. But that day shouldn't be the day where tomorrow you have zero money. Save up a nest egg before you take a plunge or find a way to work a few less hours while you're taking this, you know, this feeling of a plunge. But the biggest thing is to just give a little bit of time to some of those side hustles. And that's kind of a bad word. Hard work is kind of a bad word today. Um, but don't, but do, that's, there's a little bit of cynicism in that. Hard work is necessary. Balancing hard work is really important. And, and I, I want people to understand that because, like, you know, there's a lot of people who just push back against the aspect. I'm already, I'm already working 40 hours a week. I'm not going to put an additional 10 when I could be spending that time with my family. That's a fair thing to say, but sometimes if you put in that extra 10, I mean, you can still find time with the family. You can absolutely do it that way. And not every week has to be a 50 hour week. Maybe you're just doing 10 hours across two weeks, you know, and you're putting in a little bit of time here and there. And then once you start to create these feedback mechanisms, you get these little dopamine hits that can, it's kind of a mind (laughs) hack. If you can start to find some, you know, don't, and this is what's dangerous because if you rely on that stuff oh, yeah. and then it goes away, <laughs> that creates a bad cycle. 
But for those who kind of need that external motivation, you know, building audiences or putting things out there and getting feedback can be one of those ways. Sometimes that stuff can serve as a positive feedback loop. You know, one of the things that you're talking about, Soren, for instance, and and having this 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 big you know audience and trying little things, and you know mm-hmm. he doesn't necessarily do this, but let's say you've got a hundred thousand followers on something, right. or you've built up fifty thousand, whatever it is, you know, ten thousand doesn't matter. There's a lot of people out there that would be very into. Let me try a little thing. I'm just gonna throw that out there. See see if it works. Yeah. There's a large portion of people that'd be like, oh my god, what if I do it and it fails miserably? Oh. What are people gonna think of me? Yeah. And the thing that I've learned doing this podcast is. If nobody buys it, it's a good chance nobody paid attention to in the first place, even know that it was a failure. <laughs> so yeah. nobody cares, you know, like that's the thing. Just try it. And especially with, with the great thing about the kind of stuff that, that we might do, very low overhead a lot of times. Maybe hosting, maybe yeah. maybe domain name, 100 bucks, maybe a year at that, you know, hosting. Yeah. Pro- if you get a shared host and you're doing a bunch of, you know, multiple sites on one host, it's even less. But right. 10 bucks a year, 20 bucks a year for a domain name. It's not like we're, you know, Apple building, you know, spending, investing what, I don't know how much they invested in, in you know, having to have a space and build computers and physical products and yeah. all these things. We're not doing that, you know? So like no. try those little things. And if it fails, so what? The chances are good. Nobody noticed anyway, <laughs> you know? So uh, that's kind of something, I don't know if you've run into that or you've seen, you witnessed that, but that's kind of like, I've had to deal with that, especially deal with the podcast and things like that. What if people don't listen? And what if nobody downloads and blah, blah, blah? Like, so what? I don't know. You know, it's just, it's kind of funny. I, I feel like that's something a lot of people deal with. Fear and cynicism. I'm telling you right now, if there's one, one thing anyone takes away from this, this listen is to do what you must to eliminate fear and cynicism from your daily diet. Yeah. Because those things will hurt. They will slow you down. They'll, they'll cripple you in place for as long as they're in the room. And, and that's why I really tr- say to people is try to reframe that fear you have of, of no one's going to buy this. I'm going to release, I'm going to post something on social media. It only got 300 views and oh, look, like my, all my assumptions are confirmed. I'm terrible. I'm an awful human being, right? Is, is you have to, you have to reframe that as I'm, I'm learning. These are experiments and I am Absolutely. learning. And that experiment, it, it didn't succeed or fail that experiment had a lesson associated with it. Yeah. And, and that's how I treat content. That's how I treat every product I launched. I'm terrified. Listen, the fear's still there, right? <laughs> like I, every yeah, time I really launch something, every time I create a new idea, because t- like public, publishing ideas in the form of content online, whether it's on my LinkedIn channel or TikTok or, or Instagram, wherever, it is always scary to me. There's always going to be criticism. There's oh, always yeah. going to be uh, something that probably could have been articulated better or presented in a better way. And uh, if, if I listened to that fear, I wouldn't publish. I wouldn't learn. I wouldn't get better. Um, and, and I wouldn't get all the other second order effects from those experiments, like financial, uh, financial increase and these other things that happen from that. And so please get rid of fear and cynicism. Please learn to treat that fear as a signal of growth. You're about to do something you haven't done before, and that should be exciting. You're about to learn some lessons because like you said, the, the, the consequences of this are really much smaller than we make them out to be. We're not, in this case, in this case, we're not saving lives, you know, in this case, we're not. And one of the great things about kind of relying on yourself is you're kind of only letting yourself down. You don't have a giant team of people's livelihood that hangs in the balance of your decision making. That's also so like true, re- yeah. rely on that, like, like leverage that as your competitive advantage, because you might get good at this and you may not have that luxury five years from now. That's true. Now you yeah. have employees, you, you know, <laughs> and then you'll be like, I never thought I'd be in this yeah. place. And now I have to be more thoughtful. So in, appreciate the kind of competitive advantages that you have, uh, already right now. And you can't see those things if you're focused too heavily on the fear and, and the things that are kind of holding you back. Absolutely, man. I came across a, an article on psychology today, not long ago, and they talked about there's a, the actual science proves out that people who can forgive themselves tend to oh, have sure. like less stressful, more like happier lives, you know, and it's just, it's that idea that growth mindset, just like you mentioned, you know, every failure is an opportunity to learn. Just try not to fail the same way twice. You know, fail in a different way, learn and then go on. I think that's such a powerful advice. You know, I think anybody, regardless of what you're doing, regardless of what industry you're in, that's, that, that's a life lesson right there. 
I think that's huge. I spent some time in, um, I spent a significant amount of time, like in a, not an in-house, but like a partial thing that I attended for DBT, uh, dialectic, dialectical behavioral therapy. And it was, uh, when I was in San Francisco and it was like, a um, eight weeks, like Monday through Friday, I, I had a fortunate situation where I was able to attend this, uh, Monday through Friday, um, for a couple hours of a handful of hours each day. Wow. And it changed my life. I mean, I was in a really bad place mentally he had, and, and I was really fortunate to have this program and, and it really taught me different exercises for holding multiple truths in my mind without letting that duality kind of tear me apart. So the idea that you create something and this is an example, and that thing that you created, not a lot of people like it, or it doesn't do, you know, it doesn't meet the expectations you had set out for it. That can be true. The thing you created just isn't that valuable to other people. What's also true in that same place is you're still a valuable person. Oh, yeah. And, and, and so many, and, and it's like, it's little examples like that where we forget that when we're going through these little, tr you know, little mini traumas or huge traumas, we, we lose a job or a, uh, we go through an interview cycle and that interview cycle turns out to not include us moving forward. And, and all of us feel it right away. Like I'm not good enough. This system is rigged against me. There's so many things that we immediately just identify as individual truths. But it's, a, it's harder for us to kind of hold the, the multiple truths that exist. Well, I wasn't a good fit, uh, but I'm a good fit for somebody. You know, I'm, I'm still worthwhile. And, and really learning to like live and identify those truths when they exist. I mean, like I said, I took a whole program on it and I'm still not perfect at it. So I, I definitely understand where it's a really hard thing for people in general. But that's been one of the more meaningful things that's helped me in a lot of the, the, the mental hits that I take, cause this is, this is exhausting. Life is tough guys. And, <laughs> you know, like let's be, you know, and uh, that's yeah, all part man. of it. Yeah, you're right. All right, Tommy. So we've had you for a little bit now, before we get out of here, any resources, any, any advice or any resources or places people can go to learn more about entrepreneurship. If this is the first time kind of stepping their toes, you got any advice, any thoughts, any places to go? Uh, you know, I don't know if I have any resources right off the bat. What I would say to people is just try to try to have some fun with like the, the distribution model is so free on the internet now. You don't have to have a big audience to just it's put true. some ideas out there, whether it's a post or a template or a, hey, I made this thing. And then suddenly like I see it and I like it. And, and I have a thing where I, if I see smaller creators doing things like that, mm -hmm. I love to actually share their things and I like to, to put them on because um, I've always had like a passion for small creators. So do things like that because there's a lot of people like me that are out there. Absolutely. And, and it, it, some, you know, if you don't throw your hat in the ring, well, you certainly will fail. Yeah. And, and you know, that's, I, again, like this networking piece, like finding people like you on LinkedIn, for instance. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen? You, you don't respond to a message or you don't respond to a comment or, you, you know, you don't ever like their posts. It's just like, well, the worst that could happen. Just, just try it. I mean, either, right. whether, regardless of your hiring manager, a recruiter or an entrepreneur or, or a, an influencer on social media, who gives a shit? Just try. You know, it's just, anyway, I love that advice, man. That's, that's great. You don't try, you're definitely going to fail. So I love that. All right, Tommy. Awesome, man. Well, I got a few questions that I like okay. to ask all my guests to get our, I've, I've asked you like a million questions. These are five more questions, uh, completely unrelated to the conversation today the, to help all of our listeners get to know our guests a little bit better. Uh, you got a few minutes to stick around to uh, do, do this thing. Let's do it. Right on, man. All right. First up, what is your favorite non-design book? It depends. It's still design adjacent though. That's okay. You know, yeah, like, so I would say, um, Eliyahu Goldratt has a book called the goal that I got a lot of value out of. And yeah. if you haven't read it, I'll, I'll summarize it without the spoilers. It, it's like in narrative form. Um, and it follows like a manufacturing plant in the eighties and a manager trying to figure out like, we're doing all these things. We're implementing all these systems, but we're, we're like still facing layoffs and, you know, the, the end metrics that we're measuring are not moving favorably. And he's having kind of this crisis about why is that happening? I'm doing all the things we're supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm putting all the processes that everyone's talking about in place that are supposed to work. What am I missing? And the entire takeaway of the book, and, and, he, and it does this in a pretty uh, elegant way, is like, what is the goal of getting that factory to work? Like, what is oh, like... Yeah out of all the convoluted stuff that you've thought, what is the goal? 
And the goal being, you know, well, it's, it's, we need to help this company create revenue and let's focus on like what that means. Let's not get tied into, uh, let's not get tied into all the convoluted things that we read and hear about. And let's remember that like the way we can implement processes is, is really up to us. We can be creative about that. It just needs to, it just needs to focus on the goal. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I've never heard of that book, but that's awesome. Cause that's, that also too, I mean, design adjacent, it, it definitely, I could see exactly how that would apply to something like product design. You know, like, right. what are we doing? Why are we here? What is the, what is the meaning of life? You know, and, and trying to figure out how to make that product meet whatever goals, business goals, customer goals, user goals, outcomes, whatever it is. Um, that's awesome, man. I love that. I've never heard of it, but I will definitely add it to the oh, list. Oh, can I get one more recommendation on the yeah, book side? Yeah, go ahead, man. Sure, for sure. Yeah, I, so I read this uh, a couple months back, The Second Machine Age um, by Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee, two economists out of MIT. And okay. they wrote this book 10 years ago and, and they explore um, they, they were talking very heavily, you know, 10 years ago about the impact AI was going to have on the global and local economies. Wow, okay. And, and they really dive into that. And I, and I really recommend anybody, no matter what your stance is or, you know, where your concerns are or how you feel about AI, to read that book. It is a fantastic look into what, what's yet to come. And they predicted a lot of things, too. Okay. So well, question, how, uh, 10 years ago, how accurate were they? Are they close? Are they off or what? Well, just the idea that like when AI, AI would be silently like in, in small rooms where the mainstream had no idea what was going oh, on, right, minds yeah. would be blown. And then one day it would just show Boom. up in the mainstream yeah. and no one could ignore it. And yeah. arguably we're not there yet, but chat GPT could be kind of the first like domino effect to that. Uh -huh. um, so that's the kind of thing is like the sentiment, the impact on economy, the impact on society. We have yet to see some of the predictions or the, the things that they're cautiously optimistic about happen over, over the job market. But I think over the next 10 years, that's really oh, the period they were looking at. I can't uh, even imagine really, 10 years from now would, I mean, no, I would have never guessed you'd be able to do what you could do with something like chat GPT. Even just, even the simple stuff that it can do, you know, just summarizing right. articles or Whatever. I mean, even that alone is just incredible. Like, I, you know, your bio, for instance, I read in the beginning, you gave me a list of 10 or 15 bullet points and I just like, turn this into a narrative type bio, right, and boom, right. and just spit it out. Save me, you know, 45 minutes or an hour of work. It's just incredible. Like even that alone, I'd be happy with that. You know, <laughs> like I just, where it's going in 10 years, I just can't imagine, man. It's crazy. All right. What is your favorite meal? Ooh, that's so hard. I love food. I love food so much. This could be something you cooked, something, you know, your grandma used to cook. It could be something you've eaten at a, at a restaurant. Yeah. Comfort food, uh, whatever, I, man. I love Korean food. I, ah, I'm so yeah. big on Korean food. So just give me like some rice, some kimchi and some bulgogi and I'm good Ooh, to go. Man. Yeah. Oh, I love it, dude. There's a place down uh, by our house. They've got the bibimbap, the, uh, the stone mm, pot. Oh my yeah. God. It's just like, I love it. And you get the egg and then you... You, you like crack it and you boom, it goes over the side and it cooks. And then the rice is crispy. Yep. Oh my God. I love Korean food, dude. I think I could eat either like, <laughs> like tacos and Korean food or like the I'm, two I could I'm, just eat. Oh my God. Those two, if those I could alternate solid, every other day for the rest picks. of my life, yeah, <laughs> I'd be done, man. All right. What's your favorite vacation spot? Oh, I'm simple. And, and I've been places, but I'll tell you what, I like kind of cabin woods yeah, vibe. Dude. Like yeah, I'm dude. big into cabin woods, mountains. And, uh, you know, Tahoe has some beautiful spots that like during the winter are my jam, yeah. but, um, Northern Colorado does it for me. And I live mm. in Phoenix right now. That's where I'm going to go eventually. That's like, yeah. that's the, the goal. Once the kids are out of here, I'm going to be <laughs> cabined up somewhere. Hell yeah, man. All know. right. So, well, if you're living there, you're probably, you're probably going to get the internet, but if you're on vacation, do you go internet or no internet off grid or do you got to be connected still? I'm, I'm not at a place in my life where going off grid makes a lot of sense yet, but I oh, think- yeah, okay. I think I fantasize about it. Yeah, so one yeah. of these days, one of these days. <laughs> I know, man. I'm, I'm like, keep fantasizing about just getting a dumb phone, just a flip phone, no internet, no nothing. Yeah. It's just, it, it yeah. calls and I got T9 text, man. Back in the good old days, remind me of like high school, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I, I still, I can't, I haven't pulled the trigger yet. <laughs> it seems like it'd be so easy. Why is it so hard? I don't know, but it is. All right. What's your favorite design tool that is not Figma? Rive is kind of cool. And I haven't done a lot with it yet, but I've opened it up. I've done a course on Rive. Rive helps you with like motion graphics. And yeah, man. I never, I never considered myself and I'm not, I don't consider myself an illustrator, but there are things that like, I'm good with interaction and in, in JavaScript specifically, like it was my way of creating fun interactions between, uh, interface components. 
And Rive kind of opens up this door for me. Like I can do, I can create icons. Yeah. I can create, uh, not in Rive, but I can create icons yeah. and I, I can create interactions and I have a good sense on interaction patterns. And Rive kind of makes this more accessible for me than like After Effects, which is fine too. But I don't know. I, so motion graphics is kind of a, a thing that I'm into these days and I've been playing with. Now, Rive, if I'm, unless I'm thinking of a different tool, that will actually export it as JavaScript so that it can actually be built into the, the code base. I believe, I, right? I believe Rive can actually export for like React components. And yeah, because like that. that's the thing with myself. like Figma. I see all these amazing Figma components and it's like, oh, wow, look how this little micro animation, that's so cool. And the yeah. first thing I think is like, but how the hell are you going to build that? Like what engineer is taking that and making yeah. that pixel perfect? Like the answer is none of them, right? But but Rive will take it and actually build it and they got no excuse. They're like, there it is. There's the code, man. Just plug that little function in and boom, you got it. We're, we're getting so many tools like the, the Lotties and everybody else. It's like creating yeah. these awesome, awesome tools out there. So it's nice to see that growing. It is awesome. All right, Tommy. Well, that's it, man. That's all the questions I got for you today. Before you get out of here, man, why don't you tell us where we can find you? Give yourself a plug, all the stuff. Where, where can we find you? Where can we buy your stuff? Give us all that. Yeah, I create some whimsical design content on TikTok, at Designer Tom. Same with Instagram. It's Designer Tom on Instagram. And if you want to, to just reach out to me or see some of my uh, musings, um, Tommy Gioco on LinkedIn. Uh, feel free to DM me. I, I respond to everybody. Right on. All right, Tommy. Well, thank you so much, man. This was an awesome conversation. I think a lot of people out there definitely struggling to find work, might find some value in this, I think for sure. Go and do your own thing, man. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. Just try it out. You already got the 70%. Just do that 30%. Make some money. Hold yourself over till you find that job. Or keep doing it forever. Who knows, man? You'd be like Tommy. Be an entrepreneur for life. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Well, all right, y'all. That's it for Tommy and me for today. I hope we helped to give you some insight into how you might be able to use that time while you're looking for a job to build something for yourself and maybe realize that you don't actually need to work for somebody else after all. But I'm curious, have you tried going off on your own? How's it gone? Was it harder than you thought? About the same? Maybe it was easier? Let me know what you think on LinkedIn or shoot me an email at hello at beyondUXdesign.com. I would love to hear from you. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you feel like you're getting something out of the show, I would love it if you left a five-star review. That would help me out so much more than you know. And if you know anybody who might find any of this stuff useful, then why don't you tell them about it? That would be fantastic. And if you want to help keep the show independent and ad-free, check out all those Patreon sponsorship packages at beyonduxdesign.com slash support. You can join Chris, Siroquan, Stacy, Radu, Megan, Andrew, John, Mark, and Kevin by supporting the show for as little as $3 a month. And there are some awesome perks like that badass holographic Beyond UX design sticker. You can get a shout out on the show every week. There's even a package to meet with me for 30 minutes every month. Don't forget to head on over to beyonduxdesign.com slash audible trial to download Crushing It, How Great Entrepreneurs Build Their Business and Influence and How You Can Too by Gary V. Sign up for a free 30-day audible trial. Cancel at any time and the book is yours to keep forever. And in case you forgot, I've partnered with audible.com. So anytime you sign up for a free trial, you'll help support the show. There's no obligation. You can cancel anytime and the audio book is yours to keep forever. So get a free audio book on me and help support the show. Remember to sign up for the newsletter and check out all the past episodes along with all the show notes at beyonduxdesign.com. I hope you keep coming back for more great UX tips from Beyond UX Design. And until next time, remember you're more than a designer because there's more to UX than design. I'll see you around. Take care, y'all. What's up, little man? What you got? Can oh. we go to the library and get our thing? Yeah, we got to pick up Arlo in a little me. bit. I'm about to get off a call with Mr. Tommy here. and then, So you and can then we'll play the game? We'll, we'll see. Z. Yeah, we'll see. It's we'll see. <laughs> All right, man.